All right, so this is uh, where we left off. We'll just continue on with glomerular, glomerular filtration. Uh, GFR for short. And this is giving you some uh, numbers to become familiar with. Uh, Basically, those uh, glomeruli, they're going to filter at a rate of uh, 775 mils per minute. And um, of all that that they receive, that 775, they filter through 125. So that means 650 goes to the efferent arterial. And so that, that's very important, this breakdown here, that the 775 that's received, the 125 is filtered. 650 goes to the uh, efferent arterial. So, looking at the picture, 125 goes through. That's the filtered part. 650 goes to the efferent arterial, to the paratubular capillaries or the vasorecta, and that's important for the other functions, the absorption secretion. So, what I want to focus on now is that 125 mils per minute. Um, and that's the normal rate. And we calculated the pressure that generates that filtration rate, the net filtration pressure being about 10. So changes in GFR, they normally result from changes in uh, glomerular blood pressure, but the, the take-home point is you want to keep that at a steady state level. Okay? And so that, that's really the physiology here. How does the kidney, how is it able to maintain a filtration rate so that you can maintain this filtration rate here so you can maintain a constant year information rate of about one mil per minute. And you want to keep it around 125. You don't want to get it too high or too low because if it's too high, if you're filtering too much too fast, the cells in the nephron, they won't have time to do their job. In other words, needed substances that you need to conserve, they, they can't be reabsorbed quickly enough. So you, you lose it to the urine. Because in the end, it's just cells with proteins working at a certain rate, and it can only work so fast. So if the flow through past the tube is too fast, it just goes right on by and you lose it to the urine. Now, if GFR is too low, you might reabsorb things you don't want. You have too much time to reabsorb, like waste products that you normally dispose of. So you kind of have to regulate the GFR at about 125 mils per minute. And, and the mechanism is twofold. It's, it's, it could be. Um, intrinsic or extrinsic. So the intrinsic pathway, I'm going to teach first. It means that you don't need some kind of nerve or hormone to make it work. It all happens within the nephron. Okay. The GFR is able to remain relatively constant, 125 mils per minute, despite large changes in blood pressure. So the first concept to understand is if blood pressure gets too high, you would think that the GFR should increase with it. It doesn't. If blood pressure drops, you would think the filtration rate would drop, but it doesn't. It's able to maintain a pretty steady 125 mils per minute. And you can plot that against blood pressure. This is the data graph that's usually shown. It's not in my slides, but for example, the numbers are a range between 200 and 80 BP, millimeters of mercury. Within that wide range, you don't really see GFR change too much. It's almost a flat line. Once you get past 200, it starts to, you just kind of lose control. And once it drops below 80, it starts to drop off. But within this wide range of blood pressure, kidneys are able to maintain 125 mils per minute, okay? So the mechanisms of how it does that is what I want you to understand. So one way is autoregulatory, the other way is hormonal. And so the first way is, um, we're gonna look at the picture. The title of this mechanism is flow-dependent tubulocomalar feedback. 
a nice short title. Call this like um, an intrinsic auto, auto regulatory. It self regulates. Okay. It's an auto regulatory mechanism. Tubulo-glomerular feedback. Just try to understand in terms of tubulo and glomerular. Tube and glomerular. So just talking to each other. And you see that at the end there. Well, you don't see it at the end. Let me go through the steps. All right, so what they have here, I'll just follow the step. Let's say you can have an imbalance either way. GFR can get too high or too low. Now, they, they go with GFR is too high. So maybe for whatever reason, blood pressure is elevated and the imbalance is number one. You have an elevated GFR. And you, remember, you don't want that. It's, you lose things to the urine. And so what you do is, what you observe is, if the GFR is too high, flow through the tube is increasing. In the nephron, right? they say tubule. Now, when you flow through this tube and you go through all the parts and you get close to the end, when you get to the, the DCT, macula densa is in the DCT, it's right here. But before that, um, something that they don't say, I wish they would, I'll tell you, is if you increase the flow in the tube, you're decreasing the time for reabsorption. Okay? Um, you decrease time to reabsorb sodium ions because you're, the flow is too fast and you can only extract so much. So that means you, you have an increased amount of sodium in the filtrate. Increase sodium. So when you get to number three, it says increased flow past macula densa. Uh, well, uh, let me rephrase that. The macula densa is right here in the DCT. You should know that the, the macula densa is, is the name for a special group of cells in the DCT. They detect salt levels. They're actually osmoreceptors. detect salt levels. So those cells, they'll detect the increase in sodium. Detect increased sodium infiltrate. And to that, that's the signal that the GFR is too high. So that's why in the nephron, I, I, you probably forgot since Friday, but I, I tried to emphasize to you that the loop of Henle, it always turns back on itself. And the macula densa, it always ends up by the vascular pole. Remember I kept saying that? This is why, because they need to talk to each other. So what the macula densa does is a paracrine response from there to there. Uh, your book says that they release this basal constrictive chemical, ATP. It's going to make that basal constrict. So I'm going to list that as number four. Paracrine response. Communicate DCT to atherosclerotic arterial. And that vasoconstrictive chemical, your book says it's ATP. So make a note to yourself vasoconstrictive. Do you remember what that means? If a molecule 
makes an arterial basal constrict. Well, let's continue on. We list that step as number five. So I'll put number five here. It's the basal constrictive event. And then after this says increased resistance, decreased pressure and glomerulus, decreased UFR. So that, that's the thinking. And hopefully that makes sense to you because we already had a lecture on blood pressure and all that. Increase capital R, decrease pressure in glomerulus, that's how I'll phrase it, decrease G, F, R, that's the end. So the opposite is true, too, and you should know that. First of all, any questions on this imbalance, GFR too high? Train of thought. Well, let's check for your understanding. I'll just say, let's say the imbalance is decreased GFR. Go through all the steps yourself, talk about it with your neighbor if you want, and see if you can correctly deduce how everything changes if the opposite is true. Okay, I'll give you a couple minutes and I'll check back. GFR drops too low and you want to correct it, what's going to happen to the flow of the tubule? That's going to low down, and this is the key step here. Now you're going to have more time to reabsorb, so what's going to happen to the sodium levels in the filtrate? That's going to go down, so this goes down, so you have more time, less sodium in the filtrate, and that's what you detect. You detect the drop in sodium. And you can assume the reaction will be different. Instead of a vasoconstriction, I'm not sure what the molecule would be, it would vasodilate instead. So I'll put a VD. And drop the resistance, increase the pressure, and increase the GFR. So it's simply that. And this is how you self-regulate. Even if there's changes in systemic blood pressure, because of this mechanism, you can kind of more or less keep it at 125. All right, so. This, this area of the nephron, the juxtaposal apparatus, is really important. So what we learned just right now, in this figure, number one is number one right here. Those, those are the same. All right, so let's just kind of choose a different picture here. Um, what I call the juxta, what the book calls juxtaposal apparatus, there's um. There's a few cell types. There's only two of ones that are number one and number two. Kind of ties in with what we're talking about here.
juxtaglomerular Number one is pointing to, um, it's a portion of the DCT called the macula densa. I'll write it again. It's part of the DCT, but it's a specific part. It's the part that's by the vascular pole, correct? That's where you look for it. Now, what I said just right now, it's osmoceptor. Sodium levels. That's what it does. You just saw how it can communicate the afferent arterial to help maintain uh, the GFR. So that, that's important. Well, the second thing it's pointing to, number two, uh, those are called juxta glomerular. Sometimes I just abbreviate that JG cells. So juxtaglomerular cells, sometimes books are an L starting to call them granular cells. Because the granules contain renin. These cells have renin. They can release renin. They got it. Now, the renin, well, let's just say that these cells, they act as a bell receptor, and they may or may not release renin in response. These cells are specialized, smooth muscle cells of afferent arterial. Contain renin. Okay. But look at the macula densa cells. They're not smooth muscle cells. They're just. Most cells in the DCT are cuboidal cells, but the C these cells that are packed more tightly, they're tightly packed columnar cells. They're very densely packed, and they're columnar. They're not cuboidal, and they're of the DCT. So they're epithelial cells. So they're columnar epith epithelial tissue cells. So no, there, there's a difference between these two cell types. But you could say that um, because they kind of live in the wall of an arterial, these act as a baroreceptor. They detect changes in pressure because they live in the afferent arterial. It's very different functions. So the JG cells act as baroreceptors but the macula densa cells act as osmoreceptors, and they do work together uh, to help maintain blood pressure. Well, here, here's a mechanism showing you um, an extrinsic mechanism of how this apparatus, they, how they can work together to maintain blood pressure. Now, we've studied this before, right? But never in the context of these cells. Okay. So I got this image from one of my uh, histology books. I know it's too small to see there, so I kind of outlined it. Um, just to remind you of the mass mechanism. So where I'm going with this is... Um, one mechanism intrinsic, one mechanism extrinsic. This is the extrinsic mechanism of how uh, the nephron can maintain blood pressure. You use hormones. That's the mass mechanism. Okay, so we're going to see how renin is actually released from the JG cells. And so um, this imbalance says you have a decrease in blood pressure. So ultimately, we want to see how the kidney increases blood pressure. Drop in BP. OK, so we just talked about the macula densa and the JG cells. What it's telling you here, what we learned prior, so let me read to you what it says here. 
If you have a drop in blood pressure, this says decreased GFR. Let me write that step down. Decreased GFR. Does that make sense? Systemic blood pressure is dropping. The glomerular filtration rate is dropping. Now, what do we say about that? If GFR is dropping, um, what's going to happen to the flow in the tube? It drops. So does that mean there's more time or less time to reabsorb sodium? There's more time. So if you have more time, how much sodium is left in the tube? It should be, if you have more time to reabsorb, you have less sodium in the filtrate. Think about that. More time to reabsorb, there's less sodium. Okay, that's what I think. Let me see if it says that. Decreased sodium concentration in fluid of the DCT. Ah, yes, okay. You got it right. So decreased sodium concentration. I'll put my chemistry brackets around it. Decreased sodium in DCT. So the macula densa, the osmoreceptors, they're detecting that. Macula densa detects this decrease in sodium concentration. That's why I put a box around it. And then I put a box around uh, the JG cells. And you get renin released. So um, what's a little misleading is they put an arrow both from macula densa and JG cells for the renin release. However, which cells actually literally release the renin? The ones that got it, the JG cells. So let me put it that way. Well, let's just say the macula densa, there's some cell communication with the JG cells. I mean, they work together for the renin to be released, but the JG cells actually have the renin and secrete it. So I'll put that as the next step over here. JG cells release renin. Now the rest of it, I won't outline it for you because I've taught it before, but I'll just go through it with you verbally. Renin is released, and in the blood, it'll cleave the angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And there's a converting enzyme in the lungs that converts into angiotensin 2. And, and I still want you to know the two things angiotensin 2 does. One, it's going to target the adrenal cortex. The angiotensin 2, adrenal cortex released from the um, adrenal cortex releases aldosterone. And then you have increased sodium uptake from DCT. Um, and then water will follow. Okay, that's what it says in this slide. Maybe you do need to know that. I don't want to go too fast because I expect you to know that. I'll just abbreviate it. A and G, it cleaves that and it becomes A and G1, A and G2, does the base, A and G2, a couple of things. Adrenal, um, adrenal cortex. aldosterone release. Increased sodium um, reabsorption. I'll just put R E A E and water follows. So what I taught you a long time ago, I hope you still remember, this mechanism, you're increasing the blood pressure by increasing the blood volume. So let me write that down. So for the aldosterone mechanism, what that does is you increase BP by increase blood volume. I taught that to you a long time ago. Um, you 
you've still got to know that for this test. The other thing it's saying is basal constrict arterials. So for that, um, what, we're, what we're teaching you is the other way the body increases blood pressure. You increase BP, but you're, you're increasing capital R resistance. All right, that's the other thing I taught you. By keeping more blood in the arteries, the systemic blood pressure increases. Okay, so th those are the two things accomplished by aldosterone that help correct the imbalance there. Okay, so that, that's kind of the rest of the outline there. All right, so um, let's look at some models and talk about the histology of this uh, renal corpuscle here. If they show you a picture like this, and where are all the things I could possibly ask? Let's just go straight identification. You know what it is. Like if I point to those red things, what would you call it? Right here? Anything? I'll just say glomerular capillaries. I don't really care. What if I point, you got these two tubes up here? This tube and that tube. Now, they're arterials. Is this afferent or efferent? This one is the afferent, that one's the efferent. Now, they cut open to show you special cells. So, what if I point to one of these special cells? We're going for the JG cells, you know, granular cells. Um, that's going to be macula densa there. And that's the efferent arterial. Those glomerular capillaries, they show you uh, both layers of the Bowman's capsule. You have parietal and visceral. Which one's that? Parietal. And you see how this layer on top of the capillaries, the purple thing? Visceral. They even show you cell types. Pytocyte. Pytocytes. Okay, so um, there's the vascular pole. Remember what we call this pole? It's the tubular pole. Literally, it's the PCT. There, there it is labeled. Uh, okay. Well, what? Is macula densa good enough to identify that, or is it macula densa of the distal? I think macula densa is sufficient. They call it juxtaglomerular apparatus, but that's not sufficient, because you know the names of these two things. Yeah. So the cell type is podocyte, but the layer is visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. Okay, that's cool. They even show you the little brush border of the PCT cells. So yeah, that's, that's pretty pretty. Here, here's another. They're all they all look the same to me. Um, what's that cell type? Podocyte. It's the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule, parietal layer. But you see those like little slits? You should be able to name the slits. Filtration slits. Glomerular capillary. Um, is that afferent or efferent? The afferent. They always like to show you the JG cells there. And that's where the macula dense would be of the DCT. Okay, so don't call it DCT, call it macula dense when you're in this area. Uh, that's always what I'm going to be going for. Here, here's a different one. The afferent and the efferent are labeled there, so you can kind of see. Um, do you see how, I don't know if you can see, like there's these spindle shaped cells. But then there's cells that are kind of, I don't know what shape that is. They're showing you two different cell types. The normal smooth muscle cells are these red ones. But the specialized ones are all those other ones, you know, shaped like that. And the efferent arterial is there. And um, they do a good job of stripping away the visceral layer so you can see the glomerular capillaries, but I guess that color is supposed to represent the visceral layer. And then they show you the cell type, uh, which is a podocyte. I mean, what if I just wanted to point to one of those white lines? We'll, we'll close. Um, I would think that's a foot process of a podocyte. Based on how they draw it there, I think I would accept filtration slit because I kind of semantics. It's the artwork of the model makers starting to get in the way of what you think it might be. Uh, okay, so that's enough of that area of the nephron. I want to move on to the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, Trap filter, 
This is the most extensive tube of the nephron. And if you look at it in cross section, kind of the beginning, the end, the DCT is towards the end, these cells do more of the work because they're first. Okay, right? They come right after the, the glomerulus. And the cells have a more extensive cytoplasm, there's more mitochondria, they have a more extensive brush border. These coboidal cells are uh, smaller, and there's just not much left to absorb. So the PCT cells are the most active reabsorbers. talk about the PCT and the physiology. I'll focus on their function as uh, reabsorbers. They're, they're the most active reabsorbers. What do they reabsorb? Uh, almost everything. I want to focus on how they reabsorb sodium. I think that's kind of the central uh, theme. And once you see that, you'll see how they absorb basically everything else. Focus on sodium ion reabsorption. Come back to the DCT. And, uh, well, an analogy for the reabsorption is given here. Um, I've heard this a lot. It's called the Ferry analogy, where it's like if you want to remove something from the filtrate and conserve it by putting it in the blood, imagine you have these. Ferries, these little molecules that carry something across. I mean, this is obviously is not how it really works, but the analogy is, um, let's say you're euglycemic. That means your blood sugar is not too high. Glucose reabsorption, we're using that as an example here, not sodium. Um, if you have low enough blood sugar, you have plenty of time for transport. There's plenty of ferries to take 100% of the sugar back to the blood, so you should have zero in the urine. However, let's say you down a big bottle of Coke, your blood sugar spikes, and it's all filtered. That means you're not you're gonna run out of your little ferry carriers, your little glucose carriers. So that means you're gonna saturate, you're, you're gonna max it out. Okay? And that means you might have some sugar in the urine urine because your blood level is hyperglycemic. There's not enough transport time. So what I'm trying to teach you is that um, these cells have molecules that have rate limits. PCT cells have carriers, pumps, they're just proteins, carriers and pumps that have rate limits. They have limitations. It only works so fast, and if you just have too much in your bloodstream, you just can't. Reabsorb it all, and you'll lose some to the urine. Well, and so the idea of reabsorption is you have to remove it from the filtrate and put it in the blood. I did define it before that way. Um, when you study the uh, kidney, I noticed these figures, they use a lot. I think they're very useful to look at. So the overall um, organization here Say that you have a PCT cell. Uh, I'm going to leave some space and draw some molecules. And the PCT cell is it's on one side, it's like filtrate, which modified. Filtrate coming in. And the other side is, is blood flow that you're exchanging with. It's either the paratubular capillary or the basa recta, it's, it's a capillary, okay?
I don't know, let, let's say it's a, some capillary you're exchanging with, and that's coming in on this side. And you're able to make exchanges with it. You can remove or secrete things into the filtrate, and you have to move it past both, both sides of the membrane. They call this the luminal side. They call this the basolateral side by convention. Luminal membrane. Basolateral membrane. So to get it out of the filtrate, move it through both sides of the cell and get it into the bloodstream. So the reabsorption, um, well, let's talk about the overall reabsorption of sodium. Like I said, I would focus on it. The, the kid, just to put a number to it, like now the kidney is receiving 25,000 millimolar daily. Uh, big number. You excrete only 100 millimolar daily. So that means along the way, you're reabsorbing something like over 99.6. So you get some sodium in your blood, you, you filter 100% of it, okay, that's at the beginning. By the time you get to the end of the PCT, it's two-thirds gone already, right? So the PCT, they're very active at absorbing it. We'll talk about the other parts of the nephron, but by the time you get to the end, you only have 0.4% remaining. Um, right, so to kind of go back to this picture here, um, I put these numbers in. Just to, I want to talk about electrochemical gradients. Let's do one than the other. Let's talk about the millimolars there. So on the outside of the cell, the filtrate, it's sodium is 0.5 millimeter. And inside it's 15 sodium. And then the blood, is what, what, on the outside of the cell, I got 1.5 again. I'm not making these numbers up. They're all from the medical textbooks. Uh, but let's just think in terms of concentration gradient. Okay, if you're a molecule on this side, and you're 145, and on the inside it's 15, what's the natural diffusion way to go? Isn't it from high to low? That is correct. What about this side? If you're here inside the cell, and you want to go to this space, if you want it to go from low to high, that's not natural. That, that'll be against the grain. Okay, so that, that's the first thing. That's the concentration gradient. The second thing is the um, electrical gradient. So you got negative three millivoltage, negative 70. Zero. The electrical gradient. Okay, so consider charge now. Sodium carries a full positive charge. If you're a positive charge, don't you want to go to where it's more negative? If you're positive, yes. So to go from outside to inside here, that's favorable. What about this? You're more negative, or it's more positive. If you're a positive charged ion, that would be against your ele electrical gradient to go towards more positive. So what I'm trying to say here is, it looks like to get through this luminal membrane, it's all downhill. That's what I say on the slide, quote unquote, downhill, all right? Because you're, you're following your natural electrical chemical gradient. But if you get past this side, it's uphill. You're going against the grain. So that's why I put those numbers in. So to accomplish reabsorption, um, the cell has to do a lot of work. And so uh, what I say on this slide, it does so by effectively creating this, this negative intracellular environment. So let me uh, draw in one molecule here where they put the number one that one. That's a 
sodium, potassium, ATP, uh, or it is it's in the basal lateral membrane. Sodium, potassium, it's in the basal lateral membrane. Basolateral. Same one you talked about before. It's an exchanger. It's um, pumping out sodium and for in exchange for potassium. Okay. It's a three to two ratio. Pumping out sodium. Pumping in potassium. At a three to two ratio, I didn't write that. But look at the potassium. The potassium leaves through its leaf channels. I didn't draw a leaf channel in, but I'll just kind of draw it escaping. So by pumping out sodium, you're making the concentration of sodium low. And by pumping out a positive ion, and the positive ion you're exchanging it for, then escaping, you're also making the environment very negative. So that's a very important action right there. So let me write that down. So what this pump does is pump out sodium, and then also potassium leaks back out. So two positive ions are being pumped out and leaking back out. That creates a very negative environment. As a result, <coughs> very negative intracellular environment. And they put a number to it. That number should look familiar to you. Those that have passed 430. What did you, um, well, we talked about it in terms of the neuron, the resting membrane potential, remember that? That's the same molecule we talked about, too. It's in the kidney as well. Well, anyway, that's where that comes from. Well, and also, by pumping out sodium, you're making sodium, concentra sodium concentration levels low. Low sodium. That's great. So you're making it so on the other membrane, it's down, you create that downhill effect on the other side, right? That's, that's where I'm going with this. Now, did this need to burn ATP? That's a yes-no question. I'm going to make you answer it. Don't be like a politician and not answer it. <laughs> what do you think, yes or no? Yes. It is yes. The cell does very hard work to create this environment here, these arrows here. Okay? That's why it's called the ATPase pump. You're already supposed to know that. Now, the figure tells you that as well. The solid red indicate primary active transport. You're supposed to know that means you're metabolizing ATP. Cells only use their ATP for very important things. And what this allows is it allows for this downhill effect on the other side. So the name of this molecule is, is a sodium cotransporter. Let's use a different color. So it's uphill because they got to pump against the grid using ATP. So the other side. It's facilitated diffusion. That that's passive. You don't use ATP. We call it facilitated diffusion. So um, let's call this number two. I'm just going to call it a sodium co-transporter. Use black. It's show bad. It's, it's a basal. It's in the luminal membrane. It executes what we call um, is a secondary active transporter. It's facilitated diffusion. Secondary active transporter. Another term, facilitated. 
annotated diffusion. These are all kind of things we teach in 430. Primary, secondary, active transport, facilitated diffusion. We ask this yes, no question. Does this molecule metabolize ATP? No, but it does depend on the first one to do it for it. Okay. All right, so um, what it's doing is sodium is just going to flow down its concentration gradient. And it's going to take other things along for the ride. Glucose, amino acids, vitamins, ions, whatever. Let's say glucose as an example. Here's my little glucose molecule. It's going to go along for the ride. So that's co-transport, where two things are transported in the same direction across the cell membrane. Okay, which normally wouldn't diffuse across the cell membrane. They can't get through. Now, glucose is such a thing. By doing this co-transport, by utilizing co-transporters, the cell will ultimately reabsorb what is co-transported. Okay, it doesn't directly show that, but let me, let me draw the sodium and the glucose in the blood. By utilizing, utilizing co-transporters, PCT cells reabsorb sodium and other wanted substances. It was made easy by the luminal membrane, it being a downhill thing. Okay. So, sodium is going down its concentration gradient. What about glucose? Uphill or downhill? Doesn't matter. It could be uphill. Um, it's utilizing the energy, like the wave of sodium, it's just going along with it. Okay. It's like getting a free ride. So it doesn't matter if it's up here or down, up here, uphill or downhill for the other wanted molecule. They're, you're utilizing the co-transporter and this kind of wave of sodium going in with it. That's providing all the energy. And so uh, by doing that, you're going to get all these other things that you want to. So I'm just going to kind of keep it to that. Now the, the um, that's what I want you to understand. The, the author has. There are other steps. I'm not going to go through it. That's mainly what I want you to understand. What this molecule does, primary, secondary active transporter. And, you know, water does follow. Okay. I mean, I've been saying that quite a bit. So just think about the sodium reabsorption. Any, any questions on that? So I'm going to shift gears and, and move on. That's mainly how sodium is reabsorbed. PCT cells work by primary and secondary active transport. There are some data slides that are typically presented uh, to students to make sure you understand the limitations of uh, these processes that we talk about, reabsorption, secretion, filtration. So let me read what I have in my slide here. So you're transporting something, for example, glucose, at a certain rate. So the units would be milligrams of glucose per unit time per minute. So reabsorption and secretion, they have transport maximums, okay, like these molecules we're talking about. They work, they can work at a certain rate, but they do max out. However, filtration has no maximum because it's just a filtration function. So there's not a molecule doing work. Okay, so let me write that down. I didn't write that down yet. So let me clear the board.
So what we're saying is reabsorption, secretion, they have transport maximums. And of those two, I'm just going to talk about reabsorption in my example. Okay, so that has TM is transport maximum. Filtration, no maximum. No max limit. So what that means is uh, if it's small enough to make it through the filtration membrane, it'll go through. It doesn't matter how much is in the blood. All of it's getting through. So these processes um, depend upon a finite number of pumps and carriers. So the processes that we're going to talk about, just one, reabsorption. When they reach their transport capacity, you reach saturation or the transport maximum for that substance. So here, here's a figure that kind of shows that. The two terms are saturation and renal threshold. I'm referring to these terms here. Saturation. That term means, and it's different for different chapters, right? Saturation meant one thing for hemoglobin, it means another thing for the kidney. It refers to the maximum rate of transport that occurs when all the available carriers are occupied. So they're all working at their max rate. All available, what is it, carriers? Yeah. All available carriers are working at their max rates. They're all being used and they're all maxed out. That's saturation. Okay. Uh, bottom term, middle threshold. Renal threshold is the plasma concentration of the substrate, for example, glucose, at which, is, at which saturation occurs. So the key thing is it's a plasma concentration. It's a blood level. A plasma concentration at which saturation occurs. So when you do get maxed out, we call it saturation. Whatever that rate of transport is, again, that's our TM, transport max. Think of the M as max. The renal threshold is the uh, plasma concentration. For example, glucose. When blood sugar reads, reaches a certain point, it's too high and you saturate, that's the threshold. It's called threshold because at that threshold, when you pass it, Basically, um, you start excreting your, and, well, okay, so to look at this figure first, here's plasma substrate, and as long as your sub threshold, sub um, max transport, you can continue to increase, but when the substrate level gets so high, you can't increase anymore because all the available carriers are working, that's as much as you can do. Okay, in this example, four makes per minute. And the plasma concentration also occurs at four mg per mil. Um, so I like to give this example using, uh, like the glucose example. And they show three locations in the nephron, the glomerulus, the PCT, and then the collecting duct. Okay. They show you blood levels. They, they show you the function, filtration, reabsorption, and excretion. So, Let's do this. It helps to kind of see this in a picture form.
So in our example is that that's our substrate. We'll use glucose as an example. And um, so we'll go glomerulus. There's our afferent arterial going to a glomerulus. And the afferent arterial going out. So afferent going in, afferent going out, but this is associated with I'll draw kind of a mini nephron here. Let's see here. Uh, how about a Bowman's capsule? I just draw the nephron like that. And let's draw a blood vessel here that I can perform reabsorption with. So blood going by. So let's say you're at some concentration level of 100. One hundred made per deciliter. Okay, so let's say here's the glucose, these little green balls. They're going into afferent arterial and they're all filtered. When when they all pass by the PCT cells, you're within the normal range, so you're able to be 100% reabsorbed. How much is excreted here at the end? How much, you know, how much glucose do you expect to see? Zero. You have 100% reabsorption. Okay, so that's shown on all the figures. Um, when you filter, that's the filtration rate. Here's the reabsorption rate. And when you get to the collecting duct, there's nothing that's been excreted because it's all been reabsorbed. That's what you're supposed to see. All right, so let's keep going. Let's, let, let's get higher. Let's, let's go to 200. So I'll just kind of put three more green balls. Three more green balls here, three more green balls here, three more green balls here. You're still going to reabsorb 100%. I'll put three more green balls in the blood. So you're still going to excrete how much? Um, reabsorb 100%, excrete zero. And they, they do show that at 200, there's nothing. Well, let's go to 300. Now that's actually where you saturate. So 200, 300, that's saturation. So I'll put three more green balls at every location. Three more here, three more filtered, um, three more here. And you're still able to reabsorb all of it. But that, now you're standing at the precipice. Now, if you go just one more molecule past, I mean, you'll start to see it. You're going to start to excrete. So, that level, 300, that's the threshold, right? That's the real threshold. So, if you were to go to 400, I guess, Go past the threshold, put three more balls there, three more coming in. Are you going to filter it? Yes. Filtration has no max. That's why this line keeps going up. Right? That's how you see that. If it's in there, it's going to be filtered. The question becomes, you know, what happens here? Well, see how this flat lines? It's not going to increase. It's going to flat line. When those extra three get to the PCT, you're already saturated, so then you'll start to excrete when you pass threshold, okay? So when you overlay all three graphs, um, that's what they're trying to show you here. Filtration has no maximum, it just keeps going up, going up. But reabsorption can max out. And when, once you reach threshold, that's when you start to excrete. 
Okay, so that's why I explain on this slide. When blood plasma of a concentration is so high, when it's filtered by local marrows, all of it can't be reabsorbed. You've exceeded saturation. The amount left over or not reabsorbed is then excreted by the urine. Example, if it's glucose is excreted, you have sweet urine. The high blood plasma concentration at which a filtered substance begins to spill into the urine is the renal threshold. So in our example, not multiple choice, what would the correct answer be? C is correct. What was the TM transport mass? Now, I don't know if you can see it. I didn't really mention it, but they point to it, you know where to look. Right there. That's the transport maximum, uh, 375. Here's one that's commonly missed. What's going to be used up when you saturate? Of those choices in our example, what do, you, what do you think there? A lot of students say glucose. That's incorrect. You're not using up glucose. you got too much glucose. The limiting factor are the glucose transporters. That saturation, we got it. Um, that's a good spot for a break. Uh, come back at nine o'clock. Okay.